the Central Committee of the Communist Party, the Council of Ministers, and the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR announce with deep grief to the party and all workers that on March 5th at 9.50 p.m., Yosef Vissarionovich Stalin, Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and Chairman of the Council of Ministers, died after a serious illness. The heart of the collaborator and follower of the genius of Lenin's work, the wise leader and teacher of the Communist Party and of the Soviet people, has stopped beating. With this announcement from Radio Moscow during the early morning hours of March 6, 1953, the outside world received its first news of Joseph Stalin's death. The dictator had consigned millions of his compatriots to their doom by deportation, imprisonment, forced labor, famine, and political execution. And yet the Soviet people responded to his demise with a massive outpouring of grief, evoking the image of a citizenry in the throes of a bizarre societal manifestation of Stockholm Syndrome. As throngs filled the capital city to observe Stalin's funeral rites and interment in Lenin's mausoleum, the death of one of the country's greatest musicians in a communal apartment not far from Red Square went almost unnoticed. Sergei Prokofiev had died less than an hour before Stalin on March 5th, also a likely victim of a cerebral hemorrhage. The streets of Moscow were so clogged that three days would pass before his body could be taken to the headquarters of the Union of Soviet Composers for a funeral service. The ceremony was a grim affair. Barely 40 people attended, and the usual displays of flowers were absent. All the available blooms had been commandeered by the government. Almost a week passed before Prokofiev's death was noted in the Soviet press. These events weren't merely a reflection of a historical coincidence. Just eight years before, Prokofiev had been at the height of his fame, having just conducted the enormously successful premiere of his Fifth Symphony in January of 1945. And yet he was to die in official disgrace, impoverished and deprived of work, the victim of a dizzying fall that was the result of a Faustian bargain he'd made almost two decades earlier. When Prokofiev left Russia in 1918 to escape the turmoil of the revolution, his primary concern was the development of his career. The composer's relationship with his homeland during his 18-year exile was complex. Prokofiev was apolitical in the extreme, and his decision to leave Russia wasn't primarily an act of dissidence. After spending two years in the United States, he settled in Paris, where he gained an international reputation as a brilliant modernist with works such as his third piano concerto, his opera The Love for Three Oranges, and three ballet scores written for Sergei Diaghilev's Paris-based Ballet Russe. A virtuoso pianist, he was also in demand as a concert performer. But by the beginning of the 1930s, the onset of the Great Depression was making commissions for new works far more difficult to secure, and Prokofiev was spending much of his time concertizing simply to make ends meet. His creative values were evolving as well. Growing tired of the competition with Stravinsky and other European composers to be considered new music's supreme iconoclast, Prokofiev found himself increasingly inclined towards writing in a simpler, more melodious style. He'd also been making occasional visits to Russia since 1927, which fueled feelings of homesickness and a sense that his music could only be fully appreciated in his native land. And Soviet authorities were trying to lure him with enticements such as guaranteed commissions, lavish production budgets, and publication of his music, along with an apartment, a chauffeur, and freedom of travel within and outside of Russia. Although there was ample evidence that the harshest forms of political repression were commonplace in the Soviet Union and that every one of the privileges extended by the government could be arbitrarily withdrawn, Prokofiev, whose personality was defined by blinding levels of self-interest and hubris, appeared to believe that none of these misfortunes could befall him. Speaking with a friend in Paris, he summed up why he decided to return. Here I have to kowtow to publishers, managers, committees, sponsors of productions, patronesses of art, and conductors each time I wish my work to be performed. A composer doesn't have to do that in Russia. And as for politics, they don't concern me. It is none of my business. <laughs> 
unsettling as it may be, it's an inescapable fact that the majority of Prokofiev's most celebrated and accessible works were written after his return to Stalinist Russia in 1936, including his ballet scores for Romeo and Juliet and Cinderella, his symphonic fairy tale Peter and the Wolf, the Alexander Nevsky cantata, and his Symphony No. 5 in B-flat. Until he was officially denounced in early 1948, along with Shostakovich, Kachaturian, and a handful of other composers for writing works that were described as excessively intellectual and formalistic, Prokofiev largely prospered under Soviet rule. In composing the Fifth Symphony, he was returning for the first time in 14 years to a genre in which he'd uncharacteristically struggled. His last fully successful work in the form had been his First Symphony, completed in 1917 and given the nickname Classical by the composer for its evocations of Haydn's symphonic style. Nonetheless, in the early summer of 1944, Prokofiev gathered together some pre-existing sketches and composed the Fifth Symphony in a burst of activity over a single month. The clarity, power, and assuredness of expression in this work make it hard to imagine he'd ever encountered difficulty in the domain of abstract symphonic composition. In this piece, Prokofiev achieved a remarkable fusion of the melodic fluency, calculated use of dissonance, and orchestrational brilliance that made his ballet score so immediately appeal with the rhetorical language and highly defined structures of conventional symphonic composition. When the symphony was first performed on January 13, 1945, its powerfully life-affirming spirit was widely interpreted as a reflection of the Soviet war effort's positive turn and the imminence of Germany's defeat. But Prokofiev, a devoted follower of Christian science who believed that the essence of music exists in a realm that transcends all worldly concerns, denied the existence of any explicit or implicit extra-musical basis for the symphony, saying, I regard the Fifth Symphony as the culmination of a long period of my creative life. I conceived of it as a grand glorification of the human spirit. This feeling was born within me, and it had to express itself.